why do Orthodox Christians or your mainstream Christians say that members of the LDS Church are not Christian? So we're going to have open and frank discussion, no pun intended, Frank, if you're here. Um, we will be having an open and frank discussion. So this is not for the timid at heart possible. So you might want to adjust your volume when you set, just in case it's stand by. Maybe you want to click the button or something, just in case. So let's get into it. Let's sit down at the walking table. Aaron, let's welcome our guest. <laughs> All right, let's go. Took her. All right, so, Aaron, we will have an open and hopefully pleasant discussion. I know you have some of your members here. What church are you a member of? It's called the Mission Church. Okay. It's a Born Again Christian Church in South Jordan. Born Again South Christian Church, Utah. Okay, South Jordan, Utah. Okay. Um, and what's the what's the denomination, or is it is it not denomination? Uh, it's part of, part of a, an association of churches called the Converge Network, I think. But I mean, really, we don't really self-identify by denomination. Okay. Of Christians. Oregon believing Christians. Okay. People from a lot of different denominational backgrounds come. So okay. we're, we're, we're Christian months. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Gotcha. Kind of like us LDS months, maybe. Maybe. Thoroughbreds. All right. Thoroughbreds. I heard somebody say, I'm a stallion, maybe. Purebreds. Purebreds. Yeah. Okay. That's beautiful. All right. So let's get into. So let me just ask you point blank. We got the Facebook up because I know some people may want to. We do. So we are. Live on our Facebook page, um, Real Mormons Real Talk, so you can ask us a question or ask a question for Aaron and we'll get an answer for you. Yep. So, uh, and then we'll take some questions from the audience as well. All right, so Aaron, what are your thoughts when I say that mainstream Christianity does not consider members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter day Saints Christians? Would you agree or disagree with that statement? Agree. Okay. So why do you think that is? Uh, well, firstly, why it's not. It's not a, an axe to grind uh, in terms of culture or a tribal issue. Okay. Uh, it's not because it makes us feel good to say that. Uh, okay. We want to be good neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really a theological issue. It's really about who God is and what the gospel is. And so in a nutshell, it's because we see there to be radical differences in our views of the nature of God, who we're supposed okay. to worship, be in allegiance to, have affections for and the gospel of grace, uh, how do we get right with God, forgiven by God, adopted by God, uh, is very precious and core to us. So okay. even though people we might love dearly uh, are good neighbors and uh, really good role models for us in terms of work ethic and uh, ethics, okay. um, it, when, when, the, when those core issues are off, we feel like we have a duty to categorize it as non-Christian. Okay, okay. So what core duties or what core issues, if yeah. I would say, do uh, you feel are? I think the lowest hanging fruit, the most, the starkest difference I can put out there to help people understand just how radical this is. Sometimes I ask people in Utah, do you believe Heavenly Father was maybe a sinful mortal before he became a god? And this is all on the basis of that traditional couplet, as man is, God once was, as God is, man may be, the Lorenzo Snow couplet. So I ask people, do you, believe, you think Heavenly Father was maybe a sinful mortal before he became a god? Now about two-thirds of the people I ask that to here in Utah will say something to the effect of yes, or, or probably, or maybe, or something to that effect. Um, that's a very different answer than I get in the Christian community. In the Christian community, um, as I'm defining it here, 100% uh, of Christians would say, Heavenly Father was never a sinful mortal. He was always holy. Uh, part of what makes God God, part of what makes God special in a class by himself, is that he's always been holy by himself, uh, not depending on another for his holiness, not receiving any gifts, from an ancestor of the gods or didn't have to become a god. So when we sing to God on Sunday morning or throughout the week, or when we pray to God, uh, part of the core, the, the theological foundation of that is having in mind a, a, a God who uh, is holy, holy, holy as the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come, mm -hmm. as the angels say in Revelation 4. So that's the biggest issue, I think. I know not, not every LDS person, I, I can stereotype as believing one thing or the other, mm -hmm. but that would be the general issues that the LDS faith traditionally holds, that uh, Heavenly Father is a part of an ancestry of gods, that he's not necessarily the first of all gods, whereas the historic Christian faith says Heavenly Father is the first of all gods, the greatest of all gods, the most high, not relatively more high, not like me telling my wife, uh, you're the best cook in the universe, that's, that's just hyperbole. Mm -hmm. um, when we say God is the best God, 
Uh, we, we don't mean it in hyperbole, we mean it quite literally. And how do you get that information? How do you how do you come to that understanding? Um, um, of my of who got it? Of who uh, biblically. Okay. Right, that's our main source text. That's our primary okay. foundation. Yeah. Okay. Um, the key text, if, if you don't mind, is sure, please. Um, I quoted Revelation four verse eight: "Holy, holy, holy, is the Lord mm -hmm. God Almighty, um, who was and is and is to come." <laughs> One of my other texts that I go to is in Isaiah. Uh, the, the context is comparing the great God of the Bible, the great Yahweh, the great Jehovah. How is he different from the, the false gods, the pagan gods? And God boasts in himself. He's, he's bragging rights, right? He's, mm -hmm. he's, he's, uh, he's asserting his credentials for why he's worthy of our worship. And one of the things he says sets him apart is in Isaiah 43.10, Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. So the God that uh, Christians worship, he's got no genealogy, he's got no ancestry, he's he, he can't thank anybody for helping him become who he is today. Because he's, uh, Paul says, from him, and through him, and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. If there's a heavenly grandfather, or if heavenly father has to give credit to some other God above him or before him for who he is today, then we ought not be worshiping the heavenly father. We ought to be worshiping the first of all gods. So that brings me to this question then. So if we say that there was no God before God, and that there was no God after God. And we're looking at it as from the perspective of what we can understand as humans in our limited understanding already. If we say, or we look at that scripture and we take that scripture and say literally that there is no God before God, there is no God after God, is it possible in your mind to conceive the possibility that God is grafted from an existence that God always has been God, God always is God, and that there's no God before him and no God after him being, could it possibly be a family as one? So if I'm understanding you correctly, um, you're asking, what if? Yeah, I'm just asking yeah, you, yeah. A, I'm just, just a what if, because I know as yeah. humans, we look at it from a perspective of, let's say, well, God is God, he's God all by himself, he's never had gods before him or, or, or God after him from what you're saying from the scriptures, if we're looking at that scripture from a literal perspective, literally we look at it and from our understanding, my son is my son and we're not united. He's him and I'm me. He'll never be me and I'll never be him. However, however, we are one. In what sense? In one sense that that's my son, my name will continue to go with him throughout his name or throughout his family, throughout his generation. Generations can go back and look at Myers and go here, 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 here as one. And so I'm asking you to consider this. Is there a possibility or in your mind, can you conceive that? Because I think God is greater than where we can go right now. I think we have a piece of an understanding of who God is, and to limit that by saying um, God is God and he's always been God and he'll that's, always that's be limiting. God. No, I'm just saying. That's a limitation. No, I, I, think it's, I, I, think, I think it's limiting from this perspective that if you're saying that, uh, as you said, uh, members of the church believe that God is or was a man, that walked on the earth today, or walked uh, on the earth, period. That was a man who had yet to become God. That's okay. the qualifier. I, okay. I believe God became a man. And the, the word became flesh in Jesus Christ. Okay. Right? But uh, so again, yeah, okay. the, qualifier, okay. the qualifier would be a man who had yet to be exalted as God. Okay. So I, I'm really thinking about a personal identity, though. I'm not thinking about an abstract category. Okay. There's a really good analogy to this. Maybe this makes sense to you. Sometimes I hear people talk about, um, I have to like I said, was Heavenly Father maybe a sinful mortal? Mm -hmm. One of the responses I get, this is in the same ballpark, maybe mm -hmm. is what you're thinking, um, is, well, I should be okay with that because of the power of the atonement. If, if the atonement can take a sinner 
and make something very great out of them. And so I, I'm limiting, it is said, of the, of the power of the atonement by not allowing God to have ever been a sinner. Okay. The, 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 the tricky nuance there is, if Heavenly Father was a sinful mortal, mm -hmm. it would not have been Jesus Christ who had atoned for his sins. It would have been uh, the, it would have been a, uh, a spirit sibling of Heavenly Father that's following the pattern. It would have been some other savior on another, another planet accomplishing another atonement. So the basic idea, Brigham Young developed this idea in his own sermons, is that there would have been, for every generation, uh, a different God and a different uh, savior. So here's my point. Okay. Some people say the, the power of the atonement, and what they mean is the power of the atonement accomplished by many saviors across different generations of the gods. They're abstracting that category, power of the atonement, just like maybe perhaps you're doing here with God, is an abstract uh, category of grafting in, or Orson Pratt talked about, uh, God is like the sum of all godly attributes that have all ever been acquired by uh, any, any person you know, brought together. Okay. I, when I say God is the best and the most high, I'm trying to be, uh, as, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be abstract at all, I'm thinking about the personal identity of God who is Yahweh, that the God who has a name in scripture, Jehovah Yahweh, that particular God has always been most high. There's no heavenly grandfather, uh, none beside him, none before him. I sometimes ask people, who was the first God there ever was? And they're right, like, man, right. we got no idea. And mm -hmm. I, I said, well, I, in Isaiah 44, God says of himself, I am the first and I am the last. Mm -hmm. Besides me, there is no God. Mm -hmm. That seems very personal. It doesn't seem to be an appeal to an abstract category across all the gods in the genealogy. Okay, so you, you believe that's the foundation as, as, I'm, as I'm listening, and you kind of, my, my personality is one where at first I kind of sit back and listen. So as I'm, as I'm listening, two things come to my mind. Number one, I think some, sometimes we complicate our relationship with God with details. And number two, um, I feel like seeing God as a man who has walked in my shoes makes him a more approachable mm -hmm. God. One, one of the first lessons I remember learning at my, my father's knee, he would always tell me when I would get a little mouthy, he would say, son, you have never been a father, but I've been a son. Mm -hmm. And because of that, when, when I didn't understand certain things as I was growing up, I knew I could then go to dad and say, you know what, dad? You know what it's like when your dad doesn't get the fact that, come on, the pretty girl just invited you to the dance and you need a new set of clothes. Right. Come on. Now, you know, right. he, he would understand those very um, personal details of human experience. young boy childhood. And I don't know that, that I really want a God who doesn't understand that. Who, who, who hasn't who hasn't lived that because when I come to him in my crisis of faith when I'm at the the, the, the crossroads when when the, the pull of the world is on me I need to know that I'm praying to someone who's felt that mm -hmm. like I, I, I don't think it makes him any less God because maybe he may have made some mistakes in some other life because I know I'm gonna make some and so when I go to him and I say, hey, you know, Father, this isn't working for me. I want to pray to, to a God who understands that there are times when it's hard. So I, I, I don't know if that's a, a, a tenet of church doctrine that I, I, I really want to debate. I really want to change. I really want to argue. I really want to say, no, that's not it. Because I really hope that is it. I really hope, you hope what is it? That, that that is pure and firm doctrine that as man is, God once was, and as God is, man may become. Because that gives me hope yeah. that he can look beyond my flaws mm -hmm. and still see some greatness in me. Mm -hmm. As a son of my father, I hope that in all of my flaws, mm -hmm. that by the time I take my final breath, that somebody can say to me, you are just like your daddy. <laughs> yeah. 
And if they can't, I have lived a life worth living. Yes. So it was really interesting in the book of Hebrews, the greatest sympathizer, the greatest empathetic high priest there ever was, never sinned. The, the person of Jesus Christ in the book of Hebrews is, is, is uh, esteemed as uh, one who has never sinned, and yet he's the most intimate, closest uh, empathizer, we, sympath sympathetic high priest we have. So here, here's what's really interesting about this. If we say, that's not good enough, I need something better or more, uh, some people have said, well, we also need a father who actually sinned. What we're saying is Jesus' ability to empathize with our sinful temptations isn't good enough. C.S. Lewis had a really interesting observation. When we sin, it's like we're giving in to something. There's a pressure, there's a temptation. And when we finally just give in to the sin, the pressure is released. Uh, what's interesting about Jesus Christ is he never gave in that pressure. So he had an intensity that built up over time of the temptation to sin that he never gave in to. So he is more able to empathize with our temptation to sin than anybody. One more point here, and this is what's really cool about Christmas, is that in the Bible you have this great, eternal, most high, holy, separate, in a class by himself, species unique God. Uh, he's worthy of our worship because he's in a class by himself. What's interesting about Christmas is this omnipotent God becomes a little weak baby. This omniscient God becomes a little learner. Uh, this God who's everywhere becomes a God who's spatially right there in a the manger. So the, the incarnation, as Christians call that, not that men would become gods, not that we would have a father who, who knows what it's like to have been a man who became a god. Instead, it's rather that God became a man, that in his condescending love, uh, in his humility, Philippians 2 talks about this, that though he was uh, equal with God, he didn't count that as a thing to be grasped or held on to, uh, he, and yet in humility, he descended from his infinite glory to uh, be in a manger of smelling animals. And I guess that's probably another point yeah. of doctrine that is different. Mm -hmm. Because I see God the Father and Jesus Christ the Son as two separate entities. And so what I celebrate on Christmas it's the entry of Jesus Christ, the Son, into the world to do the will of God, the Father. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I, I, I wouldn't see Christmas as the day that, that God became man and came to earth, because that, that would have happened if we're going with our previous point, point of doctrine. That would have happened. In Can I give you a text? Did you want me, sure. Well, hold on. Yeah, let, me, let me ask this question, too. Uh, before you before you go to that text, so that's the fundamental or basic difference that says the mainstream Christianity will not accept or will say that well no Mormons are not Christians or members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Particularly if they believe those things we described here. So let me ask you this real quick. With that being said, then how do you justify in the mainstream Christian world who's Christian? Because fundamentally, there are so many different doctrines amongst, Christ, uh, amongst mainstream Christians, mm -hmm. and the arguments that mainstream Christianity has amongst themselves outside of the LDS church, how do you determine in that category who's Christians? Or are they all Christians in that category and just the LDS are off to the side? So, so really quickly, uh, for I directly answer okay, the question, right. yeah. Okay. Uh, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It's really poetic, awesome. Uh, he was in the beginning with God. Without him was not anything made. Uh, he, he created all things. Without him was not anything made that was made. Um, so here everything's, but the really interesting follow-up, it says, I think it's verse 14, John 1. Uh, and the Word, this, the Word who was with God, who was God, became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Glory is of the only Son. Of the Father, but to directly answer your question, um, put, a, put some common ground connection point a little bit here. Uh, in the LDS faith, as I as I see it, um, and pardon the rhetoric, it's just a matter of speaking. Yeah, ahead, that's about 15 million members now. Is that right? Somewhere around there. I, I like to say, if a denomination is a variation of belief, there are 15 different, uh, sorry, 15 million different denominations of the mainstream faith. 
So if there's any, any level of variation counts as a denomination, then every person is his own denomination, right? What really matters, both to the LDS faith, I think, okay. and, and to mainstream Christianity, is that there's a core, right? So there, LDS people might disagree on some nuances or some periphery, mm -hmm. but in general, there seems to be a, historically a core set of beliefs for the baptismal interview, for example. Like, those are the things that we really expect people to basically believe. Likewise, the, the, the mainstream Christian faith says, well, here's some, here's some core things. Who God basically is and the, the finished work that, of Jesus Christ that he accomplished on the cross. If I'm trusting in Christ and his work alone for my forgiveness of sins, if I've had a basic repentance experience, a born-again experience, a change of heart, and I'm not trusting in myself anymore, I'm not looking to the world anymore, I'm looking to Jesus and what he's done. And he's enough for me. Jesus, Lord, Jesus, please save me. When, uh, when we're in a local church and, and there's a new believer, mm -hmm. we're diagnosing, maybe, maybe you should get baptized. Mm -hmm. We're looking for that core set of beliefs, even though there might be a ton of stuff on the periphery that we disagree on. What's really cool about uh, evangelism, by the way, downtown, mm -hmm. when I go with my friends who do evangelism, we're typically from about five, six, seven different churches mm -hmm. with really important variations of belief, but we share a core uh, love of the basics of the gospel. So yeah, you're right, a lot of variations. People say there's uh, tens of thousands of denominations of mainstream Christians. I'd, I'd say there's just hundreds of millions of different denominations because every single person is different. What really matters is the, the, what's really cool for me experientially is when I was in high school, you hang out with cliques. I was a nerd, computer science guy. Uh, you know, I'm not hanging out with the people who are good at sports or like that. I hang out with people who were socially like me. When I became a Christian and went to college and got involved with a campus group called Campus Crusade for Christ, we had this amazing unity of, of jocks, of nerds, of socially awkward people, socially able people, just, just you know, a hundred different categories of people who came together and stuck together as a social unit. Not because we had any, like, amazing social common ground, but because we had a spiritual common ground. Our, our unity, our blood, so to speak, our shared unity was that Christ had forgiven our sins and that he, he was more than enough. Jesus had, had we have a relationship with him. Sorry, and that, that's the that's the core. And I guess my, my where I'm coming from is is a little bit of a place of pain because I grew up in the South. Mm -hmm. I grew up in Georgia, and I remember when my high school finally got a chapter of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I remember going to that meeting of Fellowship of Christian Athletes, and I made no secret of the fact that I was Mormon. Mm -hmm. And I was proud of it. And I remember someone asking me, well, why are you at Fellowship of Christian Athletes and, and Mormons are not Christian? And I said, whoa, like, for, first of all, right. by what authority are you granting my membership into Christianity? Mm -hmm. Number two, my church actually bears the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Number three, I can trace my authority to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ back to Jesus Christ and by virtue of Christ to God the Father. So if anybody should be at this Fellowship of Christian Athletes meeting, I should have been the first one through the door. Amen. <laughs> Jacoby, can I turn it around? Yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. So uh, at least from where we're coming from, every single Christian uh, is forgiven of all their sins, they're adopted by God, they have the, the, the indwelling gift of the Holy Spirit, Check. of the Holy Ghost. Uh, they have eternal life, uh, they're secured by the Father, they're, they're uh, completely accepted and justified. By so as, as I understand LDS standard doctrine, if I wanted the remission of sins, I would have to have a, a baptism done by proper priests of authority. And if I wanted to have, if I wanted to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, I would have to have the laying on of hands by proper priests of authority. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing goes for the New Testament doctrine of adoption, uh, of the receiving of eternal life. So as I understand standard LDS doctrine or teaching, at least from the manuals, if someone isn't in the LDS church, uh, they are not, if, if, they, if they, especially if they, they're, they're rejecting, well, let's just say they have not received baptism or the laying on of hands by proper priests of authority, they do not have remission of sins, or the gift, the residing and dwelling gift of the Holy Spirit. So to turn it around, if LDS people don't believe that non-Mormon uh, professing believers in Jesus don't have forgiveness of sins, 
and don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost, I actually think it would be bad for Mormons to call us Christians. I actually think the other people should say, look, you guys are not true Christians because you don't have the mission. I where, where I am, I'm, I'm so busy trying to stay on the, on the path that it really doesn't matter to me if, if people are proclaiming to be Christian or not. Because that, that's just a title. That, that, that's, that's just a title. And I think it, it matters more. Well, what, you what are you doing because you have this title <coughs> of Christian? And let's go back. Let's, let's, let's go back to what yeah. you said, too. And I, I agree with you with what you said, Tacoma. Let, let's look at this. One of the things that you said was that, that our doctrine says that we don't believe that people outside of the LDS church are forgiven or don't have a remission of their sins? They don't have a complete yeah. remission of sins. Yeah. So I don't even know if, if that would be... I guess no, that's I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't I think that I, might I don't be, know that would be fair to say. interpretation of... What about the gift of the Holy Ghost? You have influence of the Holy Ghost. Right, but not, not the, the gift. Not the indwelling Because of, the, of how the gift of the Holy Ghost is bestowed and uh, given to us. Now, we believe that God is a God of order, of order. Mm -hmm. that everything God does, he does decent and in order. And so it only makes sense to us and to me, let's look, look it only makes sense to me because I can internalize and personalize and then you can piggyback and if anyone else wants, but it only makes sense to me that if God is a God of decency and in order and everything in God's house is done orderly, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, that he would have a way that things are done. In the Christian faith, or the Christian world that I was in before I became LDS, the Baptists had a certain way that they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Uh, the Pentecostals had a certain way. The Methodists had a certain way. Some of them didn't even believe in, in the gift of the Holy Ghost. And when you go and you look at the umbrella of Christianity, you see a bunch of confusion when you look at, well, how did he, well, she, he got the whole, well, how did, and where, and, and if God is a God of order, and you got all of these things all over the place, and you just looking, and you just like, well, wait a minute, this, well, which one do I go to? How do I, where am I going to fit in? And so, we believe that God is the author of order, and our enemy is the author of confusion. And so, if God is a God of order, I got this. And, and, and you got order right here, and the enemy is the author of chaos, and we got we know exactly what we're doing and how to do it and we got this and that over here you got well wait you oh hey oh. so you got clarity over some issues in LDS faith right and there's diversity so in others I'm, right if that's what you want you want to call it clarity and diversity so there, I'm saying there's there's well, there's things that typically every LDS person strongly believes I, I'm not trying to be controversial no, 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 you're fine, you're fine. in the LDS faith uh, there's a core common set of beliefs but there's Outside of that, there's a there's things that LDS people internally have different opinions on, right? Different speculations on, right? As far as whether as heavenly, far as what? whether uh, we can be worshipped when we become gods, whether Heavenly Father has multiple spouses, whether Heavenly Father is the first of all gods. Uh, yeah, I think how we solve it, that or how we put that in a, there's a scripture and doctrine covenant, and I'm trying, but basically it says of tenants. Thou shalt not speak, but proclaim this, faith, repentance, baptism, laying on the hand by the gift of the Holy Ghost in endurance to the end. Mm -hmm. I think that that's just... Let me recommend an LDS book to you guys. Um, it's a book that it was sold at Desert. The Book of Mormon? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was <laughs> Uh, it, this I thought he was going to recommend the Book of Mormon. <laughs> Wait for Baptist preacher Mormon teacher. Is that? <laughs> I'm sorry. I it's not good. It wasn't it's not good. Go so it, this used to be sold at DeseretBook.com. It's a book called This Is My Doctrine, The Development of Mormon Theology. It's by a BYU guy named Charles Harrell. Maybe Harrell, I'm not sure if say his name. But he traces the doctrinal development of beliefs 
And, uh, you know, I, I've attended a few uh, uh, meetings of Mormon apologists, and there's like some real serious party disagreements. Just one more example out here. Um, this is really, really special, important, and, and personal to me. There's a book by Spencer Kimball called The Miracle of Forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And uh, heard of that one. Heard yeah, I heard of that one. Yeah, yeah heard of that one. So, uh, yeah. There, there's a, what some in, in other communities call Mormon neo orthodoxy out of the BYU religion department. And I'll just give you one key text here to, to illustrate it. 2 Nephi 25 23 says, uh, We're saved by grace after all we can do. Now, the traditional interpretation of that since the 1950s, as I understand it, is that if we fulfill a set of preconditions or uh, uh, requirements and qualifications of worthiness and earning uh, this, this uh, thing, then we receive this grace. About, as I see it, in the uh, late 90s, there was an author, he wasn't the first one, but he really popularized it. He wrote a book, his name's Stephen Robinson, and his, uh, he wrote a book called Believing Christ. And in it, he popularized the idea that when it says we're saved by grace after all we can do, it's not teaching that you got to do all these things and then you get the grace. He said it was pretty much in spite of what we can do or notwithstanding all we do. So there ended up being some diversity within the LDS faith over what, con what was a good interpretation of that verse. But more importantly, what constituted the forgiveness, I'm sorry, the repentance that leads, that, that brings forgiveness? Spencer Kimball's teaching uh, man, you got to clear the urges out of your mind. You never do it again, and then you can be forgiven. And guys like at BYU were saying, well, maybe it's all a lot easier than that. Maybe it's more realistic than that. I, I'm not trying to, to bash on you guys. I'm just saying uh, there's real diversity. There's real diversity. Among Christians, there's real diversity, too. But what really matters, you know, we have to ask ourselves, what's the hill worth dying on? For me, it's not the mode of baptism. For me, it's not. Uh, For me, it's not whether or not you think I'm Christian. Yeah, sure. It's well, not the hill that I'm yeah. going to die on. So, Go Jack, just, just I'm sorry, some, I'm talking too much. Yeah. Just some background on me. So, yeah. when I'm not here doing this or singing with the choir, I am a behavioral scientist. That's what I do. I pick apart human behavior. I try to understand it. And he watches me. Am I being inspected? <laughs> oh, you bet. <laughs> <laughs> For me, religion is a lot like other human behaviors. And at the very core of it, it's about relationship. Mm -hmm. What is the nature of my relationship with God? What is my relationship with Christ? What is my relationship with the Holy Ghost? What is the nature of my relationship with um, baptism, with mm -hmm. whatever? And just as um, therapists, you know, pe people, people generally come in and they talk in terms of symptoms and not necessarily in terms mm -hmm. of problems. So, so when they come in, they don't say, I have bipolar. When people come in, what they throw at me is, one day my mood is up, one day my mood is down, I'm a little depressed, and then I'm real manic, and when I'm manic, and QVS is on, and oh, I've spent all my money, and, and things like that. And so in, in order to con consolidate the list of symptoms so that when I talk with other therapists, I don't have to give the laundry list of symptoms, we have a label. We have a label for individuals who feel a little sad, and teary, loss of energy, loss of appetite, loss of interest in things. We call that depression. Mm -hmm. and, and what that label is telling us, this is the nature of this person's relationship with optimal function. And so that everybody who has that type of relationship with optimal functioning then can choose to either carry or reject the label Depressed. Mm, I'm with you. There are people who say the nature of my relationship mm -hmm. with God is mm -hmm. he is aware of my human experience because he's been there and he's overcome it. Great the job. nature of my relationship with Christ is he came under unfavorable circumstances and he didn't sin. Mm -hmm. And then on a Thursday night, on a dark, dark, mm -hmm. dark mm -hmm. Thursday night, mm -hmm. Where he could have experienced it, perhaps by revelation, he chose to experience it in the flesh. He took upon him yeah. not just my sins, mm -hmm. but my agonies, my disappointments. Mm -hmm. he, he knows what it's like to fail your driver's license test on your 16th birthday, so your mama got to take you to school the next day, and, and that's not real. Cool. He understands that type of disappointment, mm -hmm. and, 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 and my relationship with the Holy Ghost is when I'm about to mess up, he's gonna tap me on the shoulder. Mm -hmm. He's not gonna call me to code, he's gonna call me with my pen of the sport. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. And he's also the great teacher and testifier of truth, mm -hmm. as we read in John 14, 26. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the nature of God is what he said in Amos when he said, Surely the Lord God will do nothing but he revealed his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. If he say that is the means by which I'm going to let you know what's up, mm -hmm. then I'm going to make sure that you have prophets. And so that is the nature of my relationship with all things spiritual, mm -hmm. that I'm going to associate with people who have a similar relationship. And maybe we're going to call it Mormonism, or maybe we're going to call it Latter-day Saints, or maybe we're going to call it the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, whatever we're going to call it. But our different de denominations or religions or whatever, it is simply a gathering of people who have similar relationships with spirit spirituality. And you know what? Once I understand what's going on inside my own head, mm -hmm. I don't need another doctor to, to come and diagnose me. I know what's up. I'm not functioning today. I refuse to adult. That's mm -hmm. my label. Mm -hmm. I think you probably agree with me in general principle here that one of the biggest issues in counseling is worldview and identity. Our, our, our big assumptions about life, what we're really after, how, we def how we're defined, and how we identify, right? So for me, uh, one of the core principles of the gospel is that identity comes before true holiness. I need a new identity, I need a new way of thinking, I need a new worldview, and I need, a, I need to see myself rightly with God in relationship to him, and all my behavior, and, and me dealing with my greatest, deepest problem, which, which like you would agree, is not outward behaviors, I've gotta, uh, hopefully we agree here, my deepest problem, my deepest, Aaron's deepest problem is sin, my carnal, uh, enemy, uh, resistant nature inside of me to God, uh, I, I need that crucified. I, I need that replaced and renewed. I need to be born again, right? And Jesus said, he who sins is a slave to sin. So this is what happened to me in high school. I, I realized that I could try really hard, even with God's help, I could try really hard to do good works, uh, to be a better person, uh, to make progress, but I never could do enough to be righteous enough to, to receive forgiveness. I, 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 I knew, I, it, by, my, by the standard I was assuming, I thought, I've got to be worthy and qualified and good enough, and God will accept me and love me, forgive me and justify me. The turning point for my life was me saying, God, I'm desperate. And God said, you're not desperate enough. And I said, God, I'm desperate. He says, you're not desperate enough. And I got to the bottom where I thought, I can't trust myself. I'm not, there's nothing in me that can ultimately make me uh, my own righteousness. Uh, right with God. And so I finally got to the end of myself and I said, God, I I'm, I'm rotten down to the deep core of me. I need you to forgive me and completely in spite of who I am. I need you to go straight down and forgive all of my sin and just do it now as a free gift. And it was like this huge burden came off and it was like God saying, yeah, you got it. It's kind of yeah, like, it's kind of like, hold on, 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 hold it's kind of like the welfare system, what you just explained, right? Yeah. So you don't have to go to work. You just get a check. Um, but I, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me, let me just I, marinate on that. I want to, hold on, hold on. I would love to marinate on that. Just one second. Marinate on Just marinate on it. Hold on. 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 So, so what we said, if, if, if I'm hearing you right, because I've been over there on that side. And I get I, I get the whole welfare system that I don't got to go to work. You just gonna send me a check. But at some point, when you know better, you, do better. you should do better. Mm -hmm. So I get the whole will never be good enough to earn. <laughs> God's great. I get that. I see what you're saying. And I know I've talked to a whole lot of folks that say, well, you know, when Mormons believe that you work your way into heaven, but it's not about the work. It's not about trying to work our way into heaven. The scriptures teach us that Heavenly Father said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. And so it's about understanding that it's progression in the Christian community where there's so much confusion about who we are, where we are, and it's about we got to get this and we got to get that. In that community, I totally get the constant, I need welfare. 
I need a check. I can't do the work. I can't do this. So, God, I need you to help me. And if that's the kind of God you're saying we serve, one that says, I understand all your can't do's, and because you can't do, I'm going to do it for you all of the time. Amen. Never, never, Amen. never, ever, Preaching. never, ever will you ever have to help carry that cross. Never, ever will you have to live the gospel. Never, ever will you have to love God your neighbor. Never ever will I require you to exercise the fruits of the spirit. I'm just going to give you a check. Can I give you two times? Amen. Uh, you was amen a few minutes ago. You, you, you stopped amen. You, you, you was on them amen. Then you looked at me, can I give you a text? You can give me all the text you want, but it still sounds like welfare. If you want me, um, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. And, and this isn't just tit for tat, me trying to, the Bible bash here like that. This verse is the verse that God used in high school in my life. Now, you do know that in the Christian community, and this is why I brought a big hold on, hold on, hold on, yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. This is why we can we we I could go with you on the scriptures, but I don't want a Bible bash. I could go right with you, but I'm trying to refrain because one thing I do know: if we start yeah. going scripture for scripture, it's gonna remove the spirit. Well, let me tell you a story about. And if we right? if we if we go scripture for scripture, it's gonna become a, a, a whole. We can battle with the scriptures all day long. Well, let me just tell you what God used in my life. This okay. is the passage. I, what happened was I started reading through the New Testament, and I said, God, I want to read the whole New Testament in a month. I didn't actually complete that, but I got through most of it. The, 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 the moment in my life where it seems like God took his foot, and he, he, he put it on my chest, and he says, I win, I win. And, 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 and I had to say to God, you win, I lose, you win, God, is when I was going through Romans. Romans chapter 4. Uh, verses 4 and 5. This, these are the verses God used to change me. Verse 4 says, When a man works, his wages are not counted to him as a gift, but as his due. So if you work as a pizza delivery guy and you get a paycheck, it's not a Christmas gift. You earned it. You owed it. It's, it's, it's uh, indebted to you. But verse 5 says, And to the one who does not work, but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. And in my life, I thought, that's me. I'm ungodly. I, I, I can't, I'm not going to uh, succeed if I'm trusting a God to justify the godly because I'm not godly. And I said, I'm ungodly. I can't earn this. And so what it says is, if you, if you work for it, in verses 4 and 5, if you work for it, God won't give it to you. But if you stop working, it says, to him who does not work but trusts him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, one more thing. Well, it, it, one more thing. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah, you're taking away, that passage. No, not only that, you're taking it way out of context. Yeah. Way out of context. Yeah. If you go and you look at Romans, yeah, yeah, yeah send, send it up. Yeah, if you, if you take it way out of context, yeah. check this out. If, if I you work look at Romans, it, don't give it to me. Yeah, if you look at Romans in general, who is Paul talking to? You? The Romans. The Romans, right? So there are a whole lot of things going on in Romans, right? So let's look at Romans chapter 8. There is therefore, Romans chapter 8, let's start at verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do. For what the law could not do, and that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and uh, for sin, condemned sin in the flesh of the righteousness, uh, of the righteousness that is filled it, that is fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after it? the spirit. Did you do a water? I did. I did. I rewind. <laughs> Won't do it again. No, but, no, no. You want water? But, so hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold on. <laughs> so hold on. I'm on the road now. I'm on the road. Call me butter. Anyway, <laughs> so there's a whole. My point is, there's a whole lot going on in Romans. Yeah. So if we're talking to the Romans who rule everything at this point, who are the 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 alphas uh, uh, of the world right now, that's ruling everything and Paul is trying to teach to the Romans I can understand that in a Roman context kind of like here yeah there's nothing that you can do good enough right as a Roman there's nothing that you can do good enough that's going to cover up your own sin to the Romans but when he was talking to the Philippians he had a different message 
when he was talking to the Ephesians, he shared something different with the Ephesians. So my point being this, Amen. is that, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. My point being this, is that if we look at the scriptures and we say that this literally manifests itself to me, and I'm to take this literally, not spiritually, we're going to be totally confused and we're going to be sitting up here arguing about scriptures. But what we have to do is we have to take the scriptures from a spiritual perspective and look at the scriptures spiritually and dissect them from a spiritual perspective. There is no way, there is no way in, I want to say, heaven. God's green earth, heaven. Yeah, no way in heaven. No way in heaven. No way in heaven that God would take the principle of work and negate it. Absolutely. Absolutely so absurd. In fact, didn't. I believe it was Nephi who put it this way. It says, wherefore, mm -hmm. do the things which I have seen that your Lord and your Redeemer should do. Mm -hmm. For for this cause have they been shown unto me that you may know the gate by which you should enter. The gate by which you should enter is repentance and, and baptism. Then cometh the remission of your sins by fire and by the Holy Ghost. And then he asked this question, but who I will ask after you have entered in by the way, if you're done, he says, no. Mm -hmm. It is simply not about having faith, repenting, being baptized, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. God is a God of do. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you're trying to get to God mm -hmm. and you're creeping up on him from behind, you're going to get to D and O before you get to G. So if you're trying to catch up with God, you're going to get to do before you get to God. Amen. I'm feeling you like real. Man. I'm feeling you. That was my job. This, that's, that's the road you traveled. That's the road I was traveling. I think I was the only one next to you. I'm trying to My God is a God to do. Yes, so in my own experience, it seems flipped. And here's, here's how this is. When I was in high school, I hated my mother. Uh, irrationally, told you it was his mom. <laughs> hey, I had a good mama. She loved it. You can't sit on the stage with a therapist and not expect to talk about your mama. I thought you were in the behavioral in school. Not, not the uh, cognitive. Uh, anyway, I'm just like, hey, so, no, seriously, on a personal note, I hated my mother uh, for bad reasons. I was an irrational teenager, but I had a bitterness toward her. I thought she was holding me back from what I wanted in life, and I thought she was difficult and irrational. But when God saved me, when God forgave me when I was at my lowest, the, the logic that quickly followed in my life, I remember being in a car with my brother and a, and a neighbor friend, and we were just, uh, well, they, they, were, they were negatively critiquing, they were, they were talking smack about my mom. And normally I would have joined in, like, yeah, can you believe her? And the, the logic, the new gospel logic in my life was, wait, if God forgave me when I was ungodly and irrational, if God forgave me when I was unworthy and unqualified, and I had not done the, the D and the O, if I got to the G before I got to the D-O, then maybe I should love my mama like God loves me. And so this, this beautiful thing started to happen in my life, or these difficult people in my life, uh, Paul says in Colossians, forgive as you have been forgiven. And there's this beautiful story where... where uh, this woman comes and wipes Jesus. But you got to the do. Well, because you had to ask. Well, let me, let me, one more thing, one more thing. The you beautiful had, you, story. You got to the do. Because you had to ask. That's right. Let's say. Uh, you don't just have casually start passing out forgiveness. The, the order is crucial. One more thing. In Luke 7, the, this woman comes and wipes Jesus' feet with her hair. And uh, people, I think Adam is Judas or an, an apostle, other apostles, like, that's expensive stuff. You should have sold that and given the money to the poor. And Jesus, he, he, uh, he laser sharp focus, he looks at Peter, and he said, Peter, there, there were two debtors, one with 500 denarii, one with 50 denarii. They're, the one they were indebted to forgave their debts. Which one of the two do you think is more, loves the master more? And Peter's like the one who was forgiven more, the one who had the, forgave, the bigger debt. And Jesus looks at this woman and he says, this woman came in, she's been kissing my feet, wiping my feet with her hair. And she, he goes on, Jesus goes on to say, he who is forgiven little, loves little. Now here's my big point. My greatest commandment in life from God is to love God and love people. I am most empowered to keep God's commandments 
when I get to the G before the D and the O. If I have an identity of being forgiven freely by the Lord Jesus Christ and his work and his work alone on the cross, I am most empowered to fight my own hypocrisy, to put to death the deeds of the flesh. I can most, I can, I'm most able to do the D and the O. And this is all gospel issues for us mainstream Christians. When we flip it, it's false gospel. In Galatians, it's, when you flip it, it's, it's a completely different But you gospel. take something very vital away, so, which is agency. Because if you don't do anything, if you don't ask, if you don't do nothing, it's just like, God, you forgiving, you forgiving, you forgiving, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car, you get a car. You know, and, and it's, you, you've got to at least ask. So there is a do. There's a process. You've got to ask. Heavenly Father is not going to just take your agency. And we're going to get up here and we're going to have, so, go ahead and make that point because we've got to take some questions. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. And, and I, I, I heard this in, in your story about changing how you saw your mom, which by the way, your, your relationship with God looked a lot like your relationship with your mom, but that's a whole nother of the show. Y'all going to have to talk one on one. Yeah. Okay. Put some pictures and some butterflies. In the well, sorry. behavioral sciences, we, we, we talk about this idea called reification, mm -hmm. that as human beings, we somehow forget our own authorship of truth. You created a truth about your mom. That ironically sounds a lot like the truth you created about God. Mm -hmm. When you chose to take authorship of, of, of your truth about your mom and create a, a different truth about your mom, you started to see her differently. Just as when you saw God not as this being who was waiting to punish you, this being who was so out of reach, then, then you, you had a, a, a new way of seeing God. So when you change the way you see things, mm. the things you see change. Amen. Conversion at the very core is about changing the nature of our relationship mm -hmm. with God. Yes, sir. So, and I guess what, what, where I'm getting stuck is I never saw myself as being so unworthy, so ungodlike mm -hmm. that I couldn't feel that he loved me. I was always taught I am so much like him that this foolishness that I thought that I wanted to participate in was just so out of character for who I am. That, that was not me. That was me forgetting who I am. And then when I chose to change the truth about who I am, I'm a son of God. Mm -hmm. And within me is a seed, as it were, with the potential to become like God. Some of this foolishness in the world, that was not for me. We got to take some questions. Can I just say thank you for, oh, absolutely. for uh, doing the dialogue and having the spirit of that? Oh, this was. I really appreciate you. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> let's take some questions. Yeah, let's take some questions. I know some, or some statements, comments. Yes. I love what I. I'm really loving what I'm witnessing here. Because being a Christian, Christian comes from Christ, right? Christian means Christ like or a follower of Jesus Christ. Would we all agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I try my best. Yes? Yeah. Don't try that. <laughs> there is no try. There's only do. Oh, we're back at do. Back in the Hack and Spencer Pebble. It's the Yoda, right? Hey, brother, are you, are you a follower of Jesus Christ? Yes, I am. <laughs> Are you a follower of Jesus Christ? I'm a follower of the particular Jesus who created absolutely everything. Are you a follower of his word? You know, he taught, he came and he taught us how to live. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he, he uh, atoned for our sin. Mm -hmm. That's the Christ I'm talking about. Is that the Christ you taught me to talk? I, no? I'm not trying to be difficult. I just, no, I'm just, yeah, yes yeah. or no. Yeah, well, um, you know, one of the things... Jesus. You're not answering me. I'm sorry. I'm not trying to be difficult. Yeah. <laughs> Just yes or no. Is, is this the Jesus Christ that atoned for your sin? Is that what you? Is, is, why do you love him? Isn't it because he atoned for your sin? Or is that not why? Yeah. 
He he died for me when I was his enemy. Yeah. yeah so isn't that why you love him? Yeah. Or is that not why you love him? Oh, it's a huge reason why I love him. Oh, but there's there's another reason why you love yeah, him. Yeah, he made me. He created me. Okay, and and and. And how about you? Is that why? Why do you love Jesus Christ? Well, He made me too. Well, how, what, what, how about that's yeah. He created the Spirit. <laughs> okay. Yeah. And how about one? you? Do you agree with that too? I agree with that. Okay, so you all agree with that, and that He died for your sins. I'm right? not sure we do agree. Um, I believe well, the same. But you know? well, you just answered my question, and you said yes. Did, did Jesus I Christ can't... create your spirit or intelligence? What is man? I'm sorry, I'm not trying to <laughs> take it away. But, so I don't think we agree because, sorry, to, I'm not trying to pivot from you. Okay. I don't think we agree because beneath the surface of the words, uh, as I understand standard Mormon theology, I, I'm not trying to stereotype anybody, but standard Mormon theology, as I understand it, is Jesus is not responsible for begetting or, or creating our spirits or intelligences. That was the work of Heavenly Father, and that uh, he, Jesus himself was begotten by Heavenly Father. Okay, then I ask this question. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're separating Jesus Christ and Heavenly Father, right? So they're not the same people. In the, here's a, I'm, asking, I'm, I'm just asking. I'll give you an awesome answer. answer you're you're right? dividing them. And so I'm just wondering. So you said Jesus did this, but Heavenly Father did that. Let me help you out. Okay, please. Most LDS people who I talk to about the Trinity issue. No, I, I'm just asking you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is what I say to that. Okay. Most people think that Trinitarians believe that Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit are one person with different modes. But that's not the Trinity. The Trinity is that the, is that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are one God and three distinct persons who are in relationship. Okay. So I do differentiate them as persons, but not as different beings of God. Okay, so you, you were talking about, you were separating them, right? Distinguishing the two persons, the Father and the Son. Right? Okay, so you do believe that they're... In relationship, even. That's, they love each other. Uh, they've never been out of relationship. They never had to begin a relationship. So you do believe that, that the Father is the Father of Jesus? Uh, I would not say, um, yes part, no. pardon the crass language, I would not say sexually. I would not say, uh, I'm not trying to be difficult, but yeah. I get what you're saying. I, I'm not, so, so the, the, the contents behind those words, as I understand it, in classic Mormon theology, is that Heavenly Father has I, I think spouse. You're making, this, you're making this too difficult. Okay, I'm sorry. You're really making I'm just asking you a simple question. And and honestly, when, yeah. when you start telling them what they believe, oh, I don't want to do that. Think, yeah. I mean, I just asked you a question, and if you can just answer your question. I asked him the same question as I asked him as I asked you. Just answer your question. Don't tell us what we, we believe Absolutely. in or what he believes in and how it's different. I just asked you. <clears throat> I, I was once a Baptist, mm -hmm. even a Baptist missionary. Mm -hmm. And so the Jesus that I knew, that I had a relationship with, the Jesus that saved me, that changed my life, that I grew to love as my best friend, as a Baptist. When I converted as an LDS, it was the same Jesus. Did you, can I ask you a it question? Was, let me finish. You bet, I'm sorry. It was the same Jesus. And, <laughs> and the relationship I had with Jesus Christ is the same as it was as a Baptist. That's why, you know, I, I think it's very unfortunate when we start separating people or uh, judging people or saying, I'm a Christian and you're not a Christian. Christian is follower of Jesus Christ. And having a love for the Savior because of what he did for us. And, and the main thing he did for me, he loved me, he loved me and he and because of his his gospel, it's changed my life mm -hmm. and, and, and has spoken to my mind and my spirit. It's the same Jesus. I'm telling you, it is the same Jesus. It's the same relationship. You tell me no. You don't know. How you know what relationship I got with Jesus Christ? I don't tell you what kind of religion. That's why they ask these questions. Okay, I know, but but it's, you can only speak for you. You're right, and I don't know you. I'm, That's I'm right, you don't know me. Yeah. And I was Baptist, and I was a strong Baptist, even so that I, I I was a Baptist missionary in Liberia, West Africa. But then the Spirit told me to join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. I didn't want, I went in kicking and screaming. I did not want, because the music, I was like, I can't handle this. I can't do this. But you know, when I joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, the, it's, it's the same gospel. 
it is the same gospel that will get us in. It's that relationship with Jesus Christ. It's the his word. That's what we're that's what it's all about. When we die, I mean, there are people who don't know whether Jesus Christ, you know, uh, Jesus and our Father in heaven and the Holy Ghost is one day, but they have a relationship with Jesus. And the slaves had a relationship with Jesus. They knew Jesus. And, and in terms of Father in heaven, I don't know, maybe they looked at Jesus and Father in heaven as the same being. But what is that relationship with Jesus Christ? Because you can't get to the Father anyway unless you go through Jesus. So right? Yeah. And, and and so I, I say, I say to you that these men are Christian. They believe in Jesus Christ and they believe in following the gospel, his gospel. It's the same gospel. Well, honestly, it's the same gospel. Whether or not we 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 are sealed to our families forever and ever. Is to me is neither here nor there. We'll know when this life is over. Whether or not I was before I was born is neither here nor there. I know Jesus. That's what matters. It's not all the intricacies of uh, did, is, 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 did it happen this way or this way blah 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 it's your relationship with Jesus Christ and his gospel his truth so I say we're all Christians let's stop fighting let's stop fighting we're Christians we, we are followers of Jesus Christ and we, and, and we love him and we, we try to, 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 to do as he would have us do because he loved us first before, before we even loved ourselves, he loved us so much that he suffered a pain that no mortal man could ever suffer. He did that for me personally. May I say share a few things? Yes, please. In the Gospel of John, chapter 8, uh, Jesus tells, Jesus is firecracker sometimes, right? He says some pretty provocative things. In John, chapter 8, Jesus said, I tell you the truth. No, wait, I'm sorry. I'm just, I was just getting my son. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's quote Jesus, man. <laughs> in, in, in John chapter 8, Jesus says to the Pharisees, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was, I am. And they picked up stones to throw at him because they understood what he was saying uh, implicitly. He's identifying himself with the great God of Exodus. Uh, Moses says, Who shall I say sent me? And God's like, you tell them the great I am. You tell them I am that I am sent you. So when Jesus says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham, I am. He goes on, uh, they, they know he's making a claim to deity. Later on he says, unless you believe that I am, you will die in your sins. So let me just introduce a third party here to help you understand how I'm thinking about this. Je Jehovah's Witnesses. They claim to be uh, devout uh, disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. They take the name of the Lord Jesus Christ upon them. They claim to follow all of his teachings, but they do not believe that Jesus is divine in the sense that most matters. I, I would look at my Jehovah's Witnesses friends, my neighbors, um, and I'd say, look, you don't know the great I am yet. Uh, you need to know Jesus as the great Yahweh. So one more thing here. One of the things that Paul says about Jesus to lift him up and make him so unique and worthy of our adoration and worship, he says in Colossians 1, that Jesus, verse 15, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created, whether thrones, minions, rulers, principalities, everything was created by him and for him. So here's why this matters to me. As I understand classic Mormon theology, that's my qualifier, not stereotyping anybody here. Classic Mormon theology, as I understand it teaches, there's a host of things Jesus did not create. He did not create the planet that our spirit grandfather was born on. He did not create our, our, our intelligences. He did not create matter. Uh, he did not create the planets that all the other gods and the ancestries, I'm sorry, all the other, yeah, all the other gods and all the other planets of the ancestry the gods created. The God of, the, sorry, the Jesus Christ of Mormonism, as I understand it, created a subset of things in reality. The Jesus Christ I'm pointing people to, to have a relationship with, to worship, to have a direct prayer relationship with even, is the Jesus Christ who created everything. And I look at what the Mormon church has said about Jesus, and I'm not trying to be difficult with you, I promise. 
Uh, but I'm just saying the doctrine is so different that I think we have different Jesus. You know, I think the, the, the key phrase that I heard you say, as I understand it. Of the Mormon faith, right? Yeah. And so I will, I will extend this invitation to you. And I feel, I almost sound biblical. I think, I think somebody said this. And all you're getting. Get an understanding. Get an understanding. Mm -hmm. I think mean, maybe it, it, it might be time to talk to Wayne's 12 year old friends. <laughs> oh. It's a story behind wow. this. I don't understand. <laughs> to talk to the missionaries. Because I, I, I feel like. They the, lowered the age the, the, to 12. Because it's big news. But I, 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 I think if it might do you some good to sit down with a practicing Latter-day Saint, ask your questions, read the Book of Mormon. One of the ways that I avoid a Bible bash is I teach from the Book of Mormon. I'll never get into a Bible bash when I'm teaching from the Book of Mormon. Read the Book of Mormon, and right at the very end, Moroni gives us a challenge to first read with the intent of gaining understanding, to ask with the anticipation of getting an answer, and then this promise that by the power of the Holy Ghost, mm -hmm. you will know the truth of all things. All things. If you really want to know if Mormons are Christian. Real Mormons, real talk is, is not the place to get that answer. But on your real knees, in real prayer, in a real conversation with a real God, the real Holy Ghost is going to answer that question. Mm -hmm. Amen. I love that. Sure. Do you believe that's true? If you pray that the Lord will let you know whether or not Mormons are Christians. Do you believe that? And he said, but read the Book of Mormon so that, so that you have some information. And then that you have, read the Book of Mormon so you have some information and then pray to your Father in heaven. Do you think he'll give you the answer? I think he gives answers in many yes ways. No? Oh, I'm you, sorry. You gotta, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, the therapist in me over here is what? like, you know, we need to have about an hour <laughs> conversation <laughs> after this. Two things. I want to go back to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> is it on? Yes. We can hear you. They just need to hear you. Okay. Okay. I want to go back to your mother. You and your friend, your brother and his friend are putting down your mother. <clears throat> Why? Uh, frustrated with her, not being gracious toward her. Was she, her. Okay, was she involved in drugs or something or yeah. bad behavior? My mom was a good mom. Okay. She didn't deserve that. So then you guys were the ones involved in the bad behavior. Oh, yeah. That's us. It's our sin. Okay, well, it's our you kind of answered a lot of the questions. From the bottom of my heart, you spend more time dissecting the Bible instead of reading and studying it. Because everything you have said, there's an answer to. And I'll give you this if you really follow it. Go two verses before, and when it starts in the first verse, go two verses after. Amen. And you never read the Bible verse, right? Always read the context. Okay, but it seems to me you pick out the ones that say or justify your feelings, or justify your knowledge. And yeah. I'm saying you, are number one, have never prayed to the Spirit, <coughs> to our Heavenly Father in Jesus Christ, to direct you. You take it based as a man. I can just tell you how I, I try to do things. In Psalm 119, David prays, Lord, open the eyes of my heart, that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. So when I approach scripture, I need God to open the eyes of my heart. I'm, I'm stubborn and rebellious by nature, so I need God to change me, open my eyes. He also says, uh, through Paul, he says, show yourself, study uh, to show yourself uh, approved. Somebody who's rightly dividing the word of truth. 
So what I want to do is I want to think really heavily about the context. Uh, you know, if you're right, if I'm, if I'm just justifying my feelings and my experiences by taking Scripture out of context, I'm the one at fault here, and you guys are right to give me grief over that. Well, I don't want to give you grief. Oh, no, I'm not, that's not I want to tell you what you're missing. Pray and ask the Lord to open the eyes of your heart. Don't put on shame. Amen. Well, amen. Let him open the eyes of your heart so that you can see clearly. Amen. We bring it well, in. let we me bring finish. It in. Yeah. The, the one thing I'm telling you that you're missing is your heart is not involved in this. It's your mind. You're psychoanalyzing what you're reading and then justifying it into your heart. And I'm saying, throw all that out. Read and then ask Heavenly Father after every, you can do it after every verse. That's how I had to learn because I'm a dummy. I had to study and then ask Heavenly Father if this was true until I finally did it enough that he gave me the answers. Let me, let me reverse the challenge. Take the Romans for verse 4 and 5 of the challenge, by starting at chapter 1, verse 1, and then just following the flow of Paul and when he, as he builds up an argument uh, and a point and a picture, all the way up to Romans 4, and just ask yourself one question. And, and do, don't do this by your mere intellectual prowess. Do this asking God to open your eyes and help you see through. Here's my question. When Romans 4 verse 5 says, God justifies the ungodly, does that make more sense in context? Or does the, just, does the Joseph Smith translation make more sense when he switches it to say, God justified not the ungodly? That's my challenge. That's it. Well, you know, again, we, we have to look at... We have to look at... Look at the context, right? Amen. And not only that, when, you, when you're looking at the context, again, don't miss something very vital. A lot of times when we read the scriptures, we read the scriptures and we take them for face value and we take them literally. We have to take the scriptures spiritually because they were written that way. And I think that's, that's a struggle when it comes to, to faith. We, 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 we want to confine God to the capabilities of our mind mm -hmm. box. when he is best comprehended in the capacities of our heart. By saying he's the God of everything. He's, he's greater than we could possibly even imagine, but our imagination so, but you know, the, 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 the therapist in me says yes, this is about control issues. Because mm -hmm. if, if we can dissect God and understand him, right. then we can con control how God moves <coughs> in our lives. But anybody who's ever been in love knows, oh, when the heart gets in it, right. you lose control. <laughs> right. And so the idea yeah. Yeah. Of, of, of having God function in the heart. Yeah. And we can't control it? Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no. You well, let me connect with you on one point here. In Jeremiah 17, 9, it says the heart is, de is just deceptive. It's so wicked, it's hard to even understand. Who can really understand it? Our temptation, our, our, uh, our bent as fallen carnal humans, is, is not to take the truth about God for what it really is. Our temptation is to make God in our own image. That's how we box him in. That's how we limit him. We want to conform God to what we want, right? Instead of conforming our wants to what God has told us to do. Right? So our, we, this is the great temptation of, of the human carnal idolatrous bent. Uh, Roman, in Romans chapter 1, Paul says that there was a great exchange, that people exchanged the glory of God, uh, the truth about God, for lies, and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator. Yeah. We gotta take another yeah. question. Brandon. Yeah, hey, um can, can we hear? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, it's good. Yeah. So uh first of all I wanted to say I think it's really commendable that, that anybody wants to be more spiritually minded, uh, wants to seek the will of the Father. Um but what I notice a lot of times when I'm talking to my LDS friends and maybe even a little here tonight is that uh, when we get to talking about scriptures we a lot of times maybe veer away from that and say, well, we do, maybe like what you said earlier, Wayne, uh, we, we don't want to take it literally, we want to take it spiritually. Um, 
And one of the things that you also said is that we want to avoid confusion because, and I agree, God is not a God of confusion. Uh, but when we make statements like we want to interpret that scripture spiritually, uh, that has no, no base meaning, it seems like. Uh, you know, what, what does that, that mean? And, um, and I'll give an example. Um, there was an article uh, in one of the major newspaper publications around here a while back about an LDS teacher who taught a class based on one of the gospel topic essays that the uh, church had put out. Uh, it was, I think it was about uh, blacks and priesthood and, you know, a very sensitive issue. Um, and he was teaching based off of what the essay said because he felt like he had a spiritual confirmation from Heavenly Father telling him to teach that. Uh, but then his priesthood, um, uh, I think it was the high priest maybe, uh, I, I don't know exactly who it was, but they told him, his, his bishop, uh, told him that he shouldn't be teaching that because... Uh, the Spirit told him that he wasn't supposed to, and they had a, a disagreement about what the Spirit was actually telling him. Uh, it seems to me that if we veer away from the Scripture, that we actually get more confused, because that's the reason we have the Scripture, to, to tell us what God wants us to know. Well, it's not to veer away from the Scriptures. Right. Let's, not, let's not get that confusion or confused. Or, or it's not, to not to take it literally. Yeah. yeah, it's not that we're veering away from the Scriptures, but... When we're in a setting like this, a lot of times we can end up Bible bashing. I know when I was, before I even joined the LDS church, amongst Christians, we battled with, with scriptures. And I'm sure that that still goes on in the Christian community, that they battle with scriptures. And that's just not what we what we want to do. And we got to... Because really that, that, that is the fundamental difference between the law of Moses and the new law. The law of Moses was a very um, direct, particular, do this in this way, take this many steps on the Sabbath, tie this kind of knot on the Sabbath type of law. And then Jesus said, and basically, if I'm speaking, speaking everyday terms, we, we, we are going not necessarily about what you're doing with your hands or what are you doing with your heart Jesus said that the old law says thou, thou shalt not kill but I say unto you he who is angry with his brother again a condition of the heart he who is angry with his brother is in danger of judgment mm -hmm. and so I think there, there comes a point where we have to start living the spirit of the law and the spirit of the word of God because that that the, the literal word of God was shut down <laughs> red lobster would it not well <laughs> in the <laughs> Old Testament <laughs> um, <laughs> shrimp is unclean no Jewish red lobster is it not <laughs> okay if, if, if we were to take the oh, word of God literally Every man who, who takes a, a, a woman to wife better have an extra room or extra house because one month, a, 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 one week a month, she won't have to move out. Well, and you better go to your mama house to eat because during that month she ain't supposed to be in the kitchen cooking. Yeah, he said it. <laughs> <laughs> he said it. That's what the literal word says. I'm, I'm right with you. I'm, I'm right just with saying. You. But. He he said, said, ask, ask ask question. Question. Yes, sir. We, we got it. Like the last one, we got it. Yeah. Uh, first of all, I, I want to say I really like you guys. I had a good, I had a great time talking to you, Wayne. Earlier, it was uh, felt good about it, man. It felt like family with you, and I don't even know you. That was nice. Uh, in regards to the Word of God and. and and battling with verses. I understand what you're saying, man. I, I get, I hear your heart on that. And I think that if we remove, you know, the love of God and the spirit of Christ from what we're saying, it's, it's dead. It means nothing. So I agree with you on that point. My issue would be Jesus in Matthew chapter four, when he had to deal with the adversary, you know, with Satan, you know, it was just all he did. All he did was quote scripture. You know what I mean? Man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the living God. So 
I think that it's got to be with the right heart, mm -hmm. always, because mm -hmm. if your heart's dead, who cares? Mm -hmm. But I think that using verses and quoting scripture it is given to us as an example by Jesus specifically as a way to deal with, you know, whoever might disagree with you. And I, it can get hard, it can get contentious, and, I, and I, we shouldn't be, you know, so contentious. And if we're not keeping the greatest law of loving God and loving our neighbor, I don't care what else somebody says. You know, and if they can't be loving to me first, I don't need to listen to what they're saying clear down here. But I think that using scripture, uh, the word of God, as an example of how we should deal with you know, people who disagree with this, I think is very scriptural and a good yeah, thing well, to do as a model. Let me just say, it, on behalf of all, hold on, hold on. I'm going to give you 60 seconds because we got to wrap up and they keep yeah. telling us we got to go. And yeah. I know we're way over time. So go ahead, 60 seconds. Well, I just wanted to say something real simple. On behalf of uh, my Christian brothers and sisters who came here just to be with us, uh, we got people from the mission, people from the rock, uh, people from other churches here. Um, we love you guys and we care about you. And uh, I hope I'm not unnecessarily difficult. Um, but I want to let you know that uh, I think uh, I, when I think about you guys, I love you guys. And uh, that, that sounds cheap. I, you know, I, I'm really going to have to live that out and show that so I don't even have to say it, right? But I just want to let you guys know I'm not here as an enemy or um, a difficult person. I care about you guys. And I know that's, what, that's exactly why we're inviting you. I appreciate you. That's all I got, man. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We gotta wrap it up, Tacoby. You got the last Tacobaism for us? Oh, my last Tacobaism for this week is simply, you know, sometimes it's not really about learning to dance in the rain. Sometimes it's about learning to worship in the storm. Because when your knees are bent and your eyes are closed and your will is surrendered, there God will be found. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to Real Mormons, Real Talk. I'm your host, Wayne Myers. And I'm Tacoby Jackson Van. Keep it real or keep it to yourself. That's all. <laughs>